Tonight we're focusing in on Zoom with Galaxy AI on the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Ah, a baby tiger. Check out his claws as he prepares to pounce on that frog. Close one, but not as close as this Zoom. We can literally count the whiskers and... Oh look, Mum's here. Good thing I'm nowhere nearby. Go wild with Galaxy AI on the new S24 Ultra and zoom in on the epic day or night. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Today on CityCast Houston, could we be one step closer to getting regulations on short-term rentals? Plus, is justice being served or delayed? And is the sports world revolving around H-Town? Pulitzer Prize finalist Evan Mintz joins me to recap the news from the week. It's Friday, March 29th. I'm Rahil Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Evan, good morning. How are you, man? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Before we jump into everything that's happened this week here in the city of Houston, I just want to give one note out there for anybody that's on Google Podcasts, that app that you've been using. Well, it's going away on Tuesday, so make sure you subscribe to us wherever else you can, right? Spotify, YouTube Music is actually going to be replacing that app. And I've linked a story on how to transfer your subscriptions for our Google Podcast listeners. So make sure you do it so you continue to get CityCast Houston every single morning in your inbox. Now, Evan, we published our April guide yesterday. I know we're still in March, but we put it out on Thursday. What's one thing you have to do in April? In April, just be outside. You know, how rare is it to have nice weather in Houston? I don't care if you're standing like in a parking lot looking at grackles. Does it appreciate the fact that it's nice out? I think there's this sense that, oh, summer is the time to be outside. Houston is different. Like this isn't Connecticut. This isn't California. Like April and October are our peak moments. Yeah, it's the best. I spent pretty much all day outside last weekend. And it was so nice just enjoying that beautiful weather. And it got a little bit cooler right on Sunday, but Saturday was picture perfect. And it looks like it's going to be a great month. So yeah, be outside, go enjoy it while we can before May is here and it's too hot. Absolutely. Hey, let's get to your biggest story. What was something that caught your eye this week? Oh, the biggest story this week, obviously, is that it seems like the arrows must be back because they're skating down at the courthouse. Mm. Prosecutors dropped felony charges this week against Ken Paxton in exchange for 100 hours of community service, 15 hours of legal ethics courses, and paying a little less than $300,000 in restitution. The man had been facing felony level fraud charges for nine years, and this is how it all comes together? I mean, this is incredibly depressing. What happens to justice in Texas when the most powerful people seem to get a soft hand? He admitted that he committed fraud in his civil settlement. Why not just go to trial and leave it up to a jury? I don't understand. At the same time, a judge dropped felony murder charges against ex-police officer Harold Goines, who's charged in a case involving a police raid on Harding Street, where false evidence of drug sales was used to justify a fatal shooting of two Houstonians in a raid on their home. Prosecutors are going to have to refile new charges in this nearly five-year-old case, though the judge didn't exactly say why the charges were quashed. It's worth pointing out that prosecutors used evidence of going tampering with a government record as an underlying charge to felony murder, which allows someone to be charged with murder if their crime results in someone being killed. Usually it's like used for charging a getaway driver if a murder is committed during a robbery. So this is a pretty creative use of it. But still, and this is the second time we've seen a murder charge related to the Harding Street raid be dismissed. Justice delayed is justice denied. And this is just another black mark for Kim Ogg's office. What a way to go out. Wow, that is so, so crazy to hear. Let's talk about the Ken Paxton one first. Were you shocked when this all came down about Ken Paxton? I am absolutely shocked. The case just seems so obvious. Now, reporters are saying that a lot of the evidence wasn't as strong as people thought. You know, cases are not like fine wine. They don't get better with age. You have some people forget what happened. You lose some witnesses. One of the witnesses actually died, so they couldn't testify. But it just seems like Paxton's strategy of dragging this out as long as possible 
won it for him. Mm. This guy used to be one of the weakest, most vulnerable Republicans in the state. Now he's more popular than ever, at least with his base and more powerful than ever. It's a real sort of victimhood strength moment. Uh, and it's disappointing to see that this guy who seems to care more about himself uh, is flying high. At the same time, he's still under FBI investigation for allegations of using his office to benefit developer Nate Paul. Let's go to Harold Goins, because you said that prosecutors will now have to refile. That's going to be next in this case, right? They could. They could refile. I hope they refile because you want to see uh, consequences for bad actors. Uh, but they could also just drop the charges. Uh, in the other uh, case where charges were dropped against one of the police officers, it was never refiled. And finally, let's talk about Kim Og. You said, what a way to go out. Is this just another black eye pretty much on her legacy here? Well, the Paxton case isn't her, but the Harding Street raid is. And this case has been in trouble since day one. The prosecutors were not making all the evidence they had, all the records they had available to the defense. That's a bad step. They clearly messed up in one of the charges. They've messed up again. And it's taking forever to get anything done. You want to see cases done quickly, not just because we have a constitutional right to a speedy trial, but cases fall apart if you wait too long. And the sense of justice that people want to see starts to fade. Let's talk about the people, uh, justice, right? That's what the people want. And it looks like it's not going to be served or it, as of right now. What does this mean for how the people feel, right? Let's do the Paxton one first of somebody in power does something wrong and basically gets a slap on the wrist. And you just go, really, this is what we're doing? I mean, you felt forever like the state has a two tiered system of justice. When I worked in the prosecutor's office, I would mostly be in the misdemeanor courts and you'd see people pulled in there for the lowest level stuff. But it's a miserable experience. You've got to show up at the courthouse. Your life is on the line. Your liberty is on the line. Your money is on the line for stuff that people get away with all the time. But if you are poor, if you're vulnerable, it's easier to get in trouble for it. And now you see the wealthiest, most powerful people in the state or people who we entrust to protect and serve get in trouble. And they're just seen to skate. It doesn't feel fair. 15 hours of legal ethics courses. We couldn't get like 40 hours. <laughs> just 15 hours. That is nuts. Okay, my biggest story of the week, Evan, we talked about this last week on Friday, and it's about short-term rentals and how they're disrupting neighborhoods. And now Mayor Whitmire has said that this issue is something that he is working on to fix. Now, how is he going to do this? Well, the mayor said the residential properties being rented to guests for the night or the week are actually operating as hotels, and that's how he wants them regulated. So this could be something that we get some kind of solution to now. But of course, as he was talking about it with Channel 11 KHOU, he had to throw some shots at the previous administration saying that this has been an issue for a while and previous administrations just kind of ignored it. So, you know, that's what he's been doing. Um, but could something be worked out? What kind of regulations could actually be put in place? I said it last week. It should be like what New York is doing. They're making it really hard to operate and rent out these short term rentals on Airbnb, Verbo, whatever it may be. And those are the kind of restrictions you need, not that they're just going to be classified as hotels. I mean, Houston is unique in that we have these pre-existing hotel regulations that a lot of other cities dealing with Airbnbs didn't have until after Airbnbs popped up. But my philosophy on Houston is let people use their homes however they want to. Enforce the regulations. If they're too loud, if there's garbage, enforce the rules we already have against that. I don't like the idea of restraining how people can use their homes. And the more flexibility we throw into markets, the easier it is for people to find the places they need to stay. Plus, it's not like Houston is overwhelmed with tourists. I'm just kind of curious who the people are who are renting out these Airbnbs. I imagine it's folks coming to town for work, some long-term rentals as people look for a permanent position. Just let folks do it. Uh, and I really don't like this constant thread of the mayor sniping at his predecessor. Mm -hmm. You know, it reminds me of a joke. When Soviet leader gets elected after the previous one gets knocked out and the last guy he gives him two envelopes, says, whenever you're in trouble, open the envelope. So the new leader gets in trouble. He opens the first envelope. It says, blame me. So he goes out there, gives a big speech about how his predecessor stinks. Everyone loves him. Starts to get in trouble again. He opens up the second envelope. It says, get yourself two envelopes. You know, you can only <laughs> blame your predecessor for so long before people start to blame you. 
Yeah, with the short-term rentals, like who is it? It's a lot of people that are causing issues are the party renters, right? They are renting out these neighborhood homes, condos, apartments, whatever it may be, and they're just causing all sorts of issues by partying. Uh, I talked about this last week. We dealt with it in our neighborhood, and it was a mess. And yes, we would call the sheriff's department because that's who was patrolling our neighborhood, and nothing would get done because they would come in, they'd give them a warning next weekend, the homeowners renting out that Airbnb once again, and we have people doing donuts in our cul-de-sac, right? So it sucks. And it, I feel for these people, especially the ones that uh, we've heard about from the Galleria area, the museum district, where there's public displays of sex happening and there's drugs and people just blocking driveways. They don't care, right? So yeah, we need to figure this out, whether it be more patrolling, whether it be regulations, this is something that's going to be bothering a lot of people. And hopefully there's some kind of solution here, but it's going to take a while. And we'll see what happens. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode is brought to you by JLL. Get an insider view into the world of commercial real estate with JLL's podcast, Trends and Insights, the Future of Commercial Real Estate. Whether you're curious about making cities more sustainable, the evolution of office space, or AI opportunities, this podcast will help keep you a step ahead. Tune in for candid conversations with business leaders about the biggest trends impacting how we live, work, and play. Subscribe to Trends and Insights now at jll.com slash podcast. All right, let's get to our most overlooked story of the week. What do you got, Evan? Well, I think the most overlooked story of the week has to deal with firefighter pay. Now, a month ago, Mayor Whitmire announced a deal with the firefighter union to settle a longtime fight over pay. You know, they've been working without a contract. They wanted to get a raise. And controller Chris Hollins estimates that this deal is going to end up costing the city more than one billion dollars over the next 25 to 30 years, adding roughly 40 million dollars per year to the budget. That's a lot. And all that's been covered pretty well. But here's the overlooked part. Where are all the fiscal conservatives on this? They're silent. I haven't heard them weigh in. The city is adding a brand new massive obligation, and it's like a graveyard out there. The usual folks who are budget hawks like Bill King, whom I love, Senator Paul Betancourt, Folks of the Greater Houston Partnership and Power Texans, Kingwood Tea Party have said nothing about all this spending. And Alexandra Mueller, the failed candidate for county judge who's now on the Metro board for some reason, even went on Twitter to attack Collins for pointing out that, you know, we don't have this money and we're going to need to find a way to pay for it. Now, this deal includes a one time lump sum of six hundred fifty million dollars to cover back pay, basically the cost of adding a whole new extra fire department to the budget. And it'll probably be paid for through a bond that the city is going to be paying off for decades, which means interest costs and fees. Now, when Sylvester Turner had a pension deal that involved a one billion dollar bond to fill budget gaps, Senator Paul Betancourt fought to make sure that voters could have a say at the ballot box. But are we going to get a say in this one? And by the way, the pension bond that Turner added was part of a long time plan to lower costs to the city. And he got attacked by Republicans for not going far enough on that. Meanwhile, Whitmire's plan doesn't even cut costs. It ad cost and the deal is going to raise firefighter pay upwards of 400 million dollars over the next five years and nobody is saying anything it drives me nuts we're actually going to have a story with andrew schneider of houston public media on monday about this very topic and just you know what is going on with the budget side as you pointed out but also response times have been really bad since 2017 so we'll talk to him about that but focusing on what you just said yeah where are all these critics right because this is huge and chris holland is over here just doing his job he's just pointing out the fact that guys we're gonna have an issue this is something that we've been pointing out not only me but also before chris brown has been pointing this out we are gonna have an issue are we going to solve this or are we just going to keep saying, hey, hey, no, we have to get this deal done. Now, there are other things being thrown out, right? There could be a potential trash collection fee 
Houston's the only major city in Texas that does not have a trash collection fee. So that could be something that could help with the budget. Um, there are talks of maybe Mayor Whitmire going to Houstonians and raising taxes. That's mm-hmm. another one. So this is going to be interesting to see how it plays out and how people respond to it, if they do at all. I, I will see what happens going forward. You need to find a way to pay for this stuff. And typically, if you've got a mayor saying, you know, we might have to add new fees, we might have to add new taxes, Republicans are the ones who say, now hold on a second, let's make sure that this is fiscally responsible. But they are just dead silent. And, you know, if you don't have that push and pull of opposing perspectives, like the democratic process breaks down. You want opposition, you want arguments, and this is just kind of sliding through. And anytime someone pipes up and says, well, you know, this is a lot of money and we don't know we're going to pay for it, if they get smacked down either by the firefighters or by Alexandra Mueller or by the mayor's office. Like, let's have a conversation about this. Why aren't they being more critical about this and vocal? I think Whitmire was their man. They were on his team when it was time for an election. And you don't punch the people on your own team. But, you know, it shows that how thin a lot of these fiscal conservative concerns really are. If it's not important enough to be worried about it when it's happening on your side, then it shows it's just a partisan attack line and not something you really care about. All right, I'm going to get to my most overlooked story of the week and hurricane season is starting, Evan. Not really like right now physical threats of a hurricane, but the talks of it because AccuWeather's forecast for 2024 is out and they're calling for what could be a record storm season for the United States. And one of their hurricane bullseye is right over Galveston. Now, Frank Billingsley wrote this interesting blog post explaining all of this. And he said, in 2020, we have 30 tropical storms. And this new forecast is predicting that we could actually beat that number. And the official forecast that AccuWeather is going with is 20 to 25 named storms. And of those storms, we will have 8 to 12 hurricanes. And of those hurricanes, 4 to 7 will be major category 3 or higher. So I'm not trying to scare people, but the first reports are out. This is more to bring awareness that it could be a busy hurricane season and storm season here in Houston. So have your plans ready now and think about it. Don't just wait for the summer and hurricane season sneaks up on us and we're like, wait, I don't have anything ready. So this is more of a be ready, guys, because you're going to be seeing a lot of these reports and it looks like it's going to be a busy season. Uh, First of all, I'm contractually obligated to say build the Ike Dyke. We've got to do that. Uh, But, you know, I've seen a lot of warnings about heavy hurricane years and light hurricane years. And I really don't think there's a lot of accurate prediction uh, on that level months out like this. At the same time, it doesn't matter if they're out there saying it's going to be the easiest hurricane year ever. All it takes is one and you need to be prepared. So, you know, get your pop tarts, get your water. You know, make sure you've got your backup batteries and lights and everything you need. Make sure you've got your flood insurance. Uh, but all of this stuff, no matter what's going on, you need to be prepared. Yeah, last year was all about El Nino, and this year it's all about La Nina. So that is one of the factors playing into this busy storm season. If you want to learn more about it, I've linked that blog post from meteorologist Frank Billingsley. So you can read about it and go really, really deep into it if you are wondering why it's going to be so busy. Okay, let's get to our moment of joy. Evan, give me some joy. Oh, I am filled with joy to see that NASA is recruiting a new class of astronauts to train at the Johnson Space Center for the next generation of missions to the moon. Now, applications are open until April 16th. That's a Tuesday. So sign up if you meet the four requirements. One, you're a U.S. citizen. Two, you have an advanced degree in a STEM field or you've completed a test pilot program. Three, you have at least three years of related professional experience in that field. And four, you can pass the NASA astronaut physical. Now, I'm just going to say that For the sake of being an astronaut, I think that having a Juris Doctorate, a law degree counts as a STEM field. It says doctor right there. It should be allowed. You need lawyers in space. Okay, Evan, I'm going to give you the pass there. Yes, doctor, it's fine. You're good. Okay, you check that one. Let's do the physical test real quickly. Um, What would that entail? (laughs) Okay, well, first you have to pass the military water survival class. You've got to be scuba qualified. You've got to swim three lengths of a 25 meter pool without stopping. And you then, do that. Yeah, and then do it with a flight suit on. I don't and know then about tread that. water <laughs> for 10 minutes with a flight suit on. Like, no problem. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, you've got to be exposed to high and low atmospheric pressures in altitude chambers. Like I, I feel like I could do that. That's fine. Uh, you get exposed to microgravity on a jet. You know, the, the vomit comet. You've got to survive weightlessness for 20 oh. minutes. Um, and you've got to do it for up to 40 times in a day. I've been on roller coasters. I've, I know it's down. Um, okay, now here's part of the problem, though, is that you've got to have 20-20 vision in each eye. So, no, I'm not going to pass that. Can you get LASIK and get it done and then you're fine? I'm, I don't know. That's a worker. That might be a loophole. I think we could try that off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you've got to have good blood pressure. Uh, I've got okay. that. And you've got to stand uh, between 62 and 75 inches. So I think I've got that. You've got too. this. I think you can do it. Yeah. I think you can do it. Let's do it. In worst case, you get up there and it can. you can just plant stuff, right? Like you can grow things on the space station or the moon, right? This one's for the moon. We can figure that yeah. out. You've got they, a green thumb. They need someone to... Yeah, I, I watched The Martian. Like, they need someone to grow potatoes yeah. on the moon. Like, I'm there. I'm good to go. I love that. Good luck, Evan. Good luck. We're, we're going to apply in spirit. Thank you. Okay, my moment of joy, Clutch City is thriving. And I know that's a name reserved for our Houston Rockets when they were winning championships. But we are Clutch City. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that we are a sports hub right now. The Rockets are on a 10-game winning streak. The Cougars are playing tonight in the Sweet 16 for the fifth straight year as they take on the Blue Devils. The Astros are underway. We had opening day yesterday. The PGA is in town with the Houston Open. The U.S. Men's Clay Court Championships featuring Francis Tiafo is here, so you've got tennis covered as well. The Houston Sabercats, which is the rugby team, they're undefeated. The Houston Roughnecks, which is part of the former XFL, UFFL now, they're starting play. Evan, we are such a great hub for sports. And when everything is clicking and teams are winning, it is fantastic. It is so much fun to live here and root on our teams. But man, what a time to be in Houston. Now, I'm glad that you're happy. I'm glad that so many people are happy. I am torn up, though, because the Rice women's basketball team lost to LSU in the first round. Yeah. So I've been all torn up, but I'm glad everyone else is having a good time. That was a tough loss, but look, LSU is really good, and oh, yeah. that LSU-Iowa rematch is going to be spicy when it does happen. So we're watching the Women's College Basketball Tournament as well. Look, my Texas Longhorns, number one seed, hey, they got to get they got to get to the Final Four at least, so we'll keep an mm -hmm. eye on that. But man, what a time to be a Houstonian, and what a podcast episode this was. Thank you so much for joining us, Evan, and we will talk to you down the road. It was wonderful. See you next time. That was Evan Mintz. You can find all the stories in our show notes. And while you're there, you better act fast and grab some tickets to our live taping on April 5th before the Houston Rockets versus Miami Heat game because the CityCast Houston section is selling out fast. Now, we're going to be in section 403, but you can sit anywhere and use the discount code in the show notes for your tickets. And that ticket will grant you access to our live taping before the game in addition to the game itself. <laughs> That will do it for this week here on CityCast Houston. Our producers are Carly on Jones and Joyce Tang. Our newsletter editor is Brooke Lewis, and the host is me, Raquel Ramzanali. Our music is by the band All the Kimonos. We'll be back on Monday with a look at what exactly is happening with the new firefighters deal Mayor Whitmire has worked on. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. Hurricane Bull's Eyes. Ugh, bull's Eyes. Ugh. I can't say it. Hurricane Bull's Eye. Okay. <laughs>